Thanks for tuning in. This is Justin with Zounds. Got a great live stream today. I'm sure one that a bunch of you out there will find hopefully very useful. It is a live stream on how to mic a guitar amplifier. So I'm sure all of you out there have at least maybe had the experience of trying to mic a guitar amplifier, but we're going to go through best practices and tips and tricks. Um, basically just everything about the uh, absolute basics to start by uh, uh, doing the uh, uh, miking a guitar amp. So without further ado, let's just dive right in guys. So I'm sure all of you out there have been doing home recording a lot, especially I know during quarantine the past couple of years, I know I was doing a bunch of guitar recordings, messing with microphones, doing home recordings. So uh, this is probably near and dear to a lot of us. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what we need to do from, from the ground up to get a guitar mic set on an amplifier to get the best possible tone. Um, and oh, as always, guys, uh, we have the chat pulled up here. So if you guys have any questions, you want me to expound on anything, uh, feel free to drop a line there. I got the chat pulled up so I can help you out there. Um, so let's talk about uh, microphones first. So that's always the first step. You got to go and figure out what microphone you need for the job. So let's talk about the different types of microphones. First off is a, uh, one of the most useful ones for guitars, a dynamic microphone. And that's kind of the ubiquitous uh, uh, microphone that we've all seen. And um, Pat, if we, can, if we got that shot right there, the amplifier, you can see that one in the middle? That's like the, the standard go-to uh, microphone right there, the Shure SM57. That is a dynamic microphone. And you might be wondering, okay, what is a dynamic microphone? Essentially, it is a microphone that is able to handle incredibly loud sources uh, very cleanly there. So that's why they're so great for guitar amplifiers. So benefit of a dynamic microphone is that it kind of has low sensitivity. So it's got a lot of kind of um, forgiveness, uh, so to speak. So you can throw it up in front of a guitar and pretty much wherever you set it, you're going to get a good tone. But you can always experiment and find a best tone there, kind of a sweet spot. But Right away though, the dynamic is very forgiving. So that's why the SM57 is like that industry standard. It takes volume well and it's super, just kind of does what it does and it's reliable. So, so anyways, that's a dynamic microphone. That's the main benefit. So I would say for those out there that are shopping for a mic, uh, check out the Zound selection there for dynamics and that's always a great place to start. Um, so let's go on to a different kind. So one on the right here, if you notice that microphone there, uh, that is an AKG C414. So that is uh, the class of microphones known as a condenser microphone. And so a condenser microphone is kind of the opposite in many ways of a dynamic. The way it picks up sound is different and the sensitivity is incredibly high. So it picks up very small nuances in sound. So it's not quite as forgiving. It's a lot more sensitive to placement and it has a different response than a dynamic mic will. So essentially it's super flat and it has a extended range. So it picks up more lows than a dynamic and even more highs, especially the highest highs there. So usually going to use condensers for that kind of thing. Acoustic instruments, you know, maybe an acoustic guitar, violin, uh, you know, upright bass. You can even do overhead cymbals if you want to capture all that, you know, nice high frequency content, million uses for it. But a condenser, the main difference is that it's much more sensitive. So you can even notice right now the general placement of the microphone right here is about six inches back from the uh, uh, amplifier speaker because it's so sensitive, you can't really put it straight up against the speaker cone. It's just gonna sound horrible and blown out. So uh, that's the main difference for a condenser microphone. Uh, now the last one, you'll notice over here on the left, this is an SE Electronics VR1 mic, which is actually a ribbon microphone. And I know ribbons kind of, especially nowadays, ribbons are very sought after because they also do a, a specific thing and they have a certain character to them. Uh, ribbons are a dynamic microphone. They're a class of dynamic microphones though. So it just also picks up the sound in a different way, but you can pretty much treat it like a dynamic. It just has different sensitivity as well. Um, to not go too deep into it, if you have a power source for a ribbon microphone, it's gonna be a lot more sensitive than one that is unpowered or passive, which is like this microphone. So this one's a little bit easier to work with. It's a little bit more forgiving. So we love using it here uh, uh, for the Zound streams. We've used the VR1 and the SM57, especially in conjunction for literally months now. So for anybody out there who tuned in before, you've heard these two microphones before on our streams. So that's a ribbon microphone. Cool part about a ribbon is it kind of has like this natural high-end taper to it. So they're a lot kind of darker in the upper range, which makes them great for certain other instruments like 
you know, bass guitar or even strings again. Acoustic guitar is really great. A million things. Vocals. There's so many great uses for it. But the character of a ribbon is it tends to have a high end roll off. So a little fun fact out there is uh, back in the old studio days when people were cutting on consoles and vinyl, they didn't like using ribbons because of the roll off because it sounded muddy. Because when you record to a console or to tape anyways, it would roll off anyways. So it's like the conjunction of both of them doing that would create this muddy sound and engineers kind of steered away from them for some applications. But then we get to the modern age, right? We're in the digital realm. We're recording to digital with full frequency. Ribbons are sometimes just perfect and they sound amazing. So I would highly recommend checking out some ribbons if you want some kind of more vibey colored sounds. So anyways, these are our three classes of microphones we're working with today. Um, and uh, like I guess, like I said, guys, uh, we have the uh, microphones uh, classes right here for ribbons, AKG, you know, the dynamic microphones in the chat. So check that out. Ton of useful stuff there to go shopping there. All right. Anyways, uh, to get back to this, that's our three classes of microphones, dynamic, condenser and the ribbon. So let's see what, uh, what we get when we start feeding uh, signals into our amp. And I'm going to start moving microphones around and give you guys a lay of the land and how it'll change your tone when you record. But before we get there, let's talk about that. There's ways that you have to set your microphone on your amp uh, to get the tone to change. And so that's the second step. First is choosing your mic, obviously. Second step is placing it. So when we're trying to place it on our amp, you might be wondering, well, how close do I put it? Where do I put it? Well, there's a best practice. And for me, I always start with the 57 for electric. And as long as that sounds good, um, uh, then I always usually will go with that as kind of a starting point. So got our 57 here. My favorite thing to do is to basically go put it between the center of the speaker and the edge of the speaker. Uh, we got a comment. Says, Thanks for these videos, by the way. They're very helpful. I wish more people would watch live. Oh, yeah, I agree. And uh, I'm glad you find the videos helpful. Thanks for tuning in. So a good place to start is place the SM57 facing directly at the speaker. You find the center of the cone and the edge of the cone and put it somewhere in between those two. You don't want it dead in the center and you don't want it right on the edge. And we'll talk about why, but you want to start somewhere in the middle and that's a good place to start. Now, um, I kind of use like a, like a finger width or so between the front of the microphone capsule and the actual grill of the amp. Somewhere around like a finger length is it also a good place to start. And, you know, other factors may influence that. But again, this is always a good place to start. And who knows, sometimes you get great tone right away doing that and then you're done. So, so anyways, place it between the center and the edge. But for those out there that are kind of uh, new to it, you might be thinking, okay, well, where the heck is the cone at on the amplifier? Well, good place to uh, uh, figure out is either by touching it, you can just push lightly on the grill cloth and find the perimeter of the speaker there. And once you find that, you'll know where the edge is if you just kind of trace around and spot it. Or what you can do is you can just take your phone out and use the flashlight, shine it through, and you should be able to clearly see the speaker uh, inside the amp. So that's how you find out where to put it at. Uh, my SM57 is exactly in that spot right now, somewhere between the center and the edge and just kind of right up there, maybe about half inch away from the grill. So as long as you guys are still with me on that, that's where I put the 57. And actually, before we go any further, let's actually just hear how that sounds. So, um, let me show you guys my rig here. Got my sound samples pulled up in logic. And what we are running through is a quantum 2026. I'm sorry, Quantum 2626 interface, uh, PreSonus. And uh, we are routing all the microphones directly in here. And also, we have uh, a uh, radial reamp box. It's the uh, JCR Studio reamper. So this one is very awesome. Uh, I use it all the time. So I'm reamping my pre-recorded signals into the reamp box, sending it out into an amplifier to be recorded. So I know I'm going very quickly, so again, feel free to stop me if you want clarification on the rig. But all I'm doing is sending samples out of my interface into the reamp box. Reamp box is sending it to this amp. We're going to record from there. And so I can just show you guys all that stuff without having to play. So the amplifier. Uh, this is a Mesa, uh, Mesa Boogie Badlander. So the Badlander is the Badlander 50 watt combo. And I believe I have it scaled down to 20 watts right now. So we're on the 20 watt setting. We're gonna go for both channels as well, so you get to hear clean and dirty. Should be fun. But yeah, uh, without further ado, that's the rig, and we're gonna hit the Badlander amp with the uh, SM57 mic, 
we'll hear how it sounds. So let's, let's pull up our quick first sample. Um, I'm just going to, let's, let's just pick this sample. This is kind of a strummy kind of rhythm uh, sound there. So let's just block this off. And so when I, all I'm doing right now is basically just routing uh, a channel through the uh, reamp. Oops. That is not what I wanted at all. Hold on here, people. Sorry, I was monitoring that. All right, so if we go into our settings, I'm sending it out of uh, output four of the interface. I don't have it set to an input, so it should be okay. Let me double check, make sure everything's cool. All right, I was input monitoring before we started on that one, so that was why I had feedback. Cool, so we're gonna send that out now. It should be able to be picked up on a new channel. Let's just go to input one. That is our SM57, so let's hear how it sounds. So. So you can kind of hear it's just kind of a typical uh, rhythm channel there. Uh, I'm sorry, a rhythm guitar sound. So let's first do the next step because now you guys generally heard how it sounds to place a 57 mic there. Let's go mess with the tone. That's obviously our third step. We got to generally place the mic, but we want the tone of the amp to be good. So let's just dial in how we think it sounds best and then we'll try to capture that with our 57. So I'm just gonna let this play again and I'm gonna mess around with it and tweak it a tiny bit and then we'll, we'll see where we're at. So. All right, so that sounds pretty good to me. I just pulled out a little bit of mids, uh, added a little bit of presence. So that's about it. So let's just start moving our microphone now. Um, and uh, before I even do that, one more thing to tell you guys that might be helpful is really understand what sound you're going for in the first place before you start moving the mic. And if you really like your guitar tone, just get up in front of the speaker a couple feet away and really just hear it as close as you can to where the sound is coming out of and just kind of get familiar with that. And then once you're moving the mic, you can kind of best, most accurately kind of try to capture that sound as clean as possible. Since, uh, I don't know about you guys, but whenever you're playing, usually your amp is behind you, pr probably several feet. You're a couple feet above it listening to it. So it's not quite the same as the sound of it directly on top of and a microphone in front of the speaker. So a lot of times I'll have people talk about um, recording and they're like, why does my guitar sound so like brittle when I'm recording it? Well, maybe it's a lot brighter than you think it is. You just haven't had your ear right up on the speaker. So that's just something to uh, kind of uh, keep in mind when you're doing this. Really understand the sound you need, and it helps uh, if you understand what your sound coming out of your amp is just in the rawest, closest form. So anyways, just a quick tip there. Get, up, get all up in your amp's business and really understand what it sounds like. So let's go back. Uh, now, let's start moving the mic. But moving the mic is uh, kind of a process. I mean, you'll start noticing that there's big changes that happen even with small movement. So that's the name of the game here is you really want to move something, you know, a half an inch, an inch at the most when you're doing sound choices and mic placement because it makes such a big difference. So anyways, uh, let's talk about that. How does moving the mic change the sound? You might be wondering, well, yeah, what? Where do I put it at if I want to change the sound? Well, good rule of thumb is uh, start by understanding how the movements affect it. So if you want to get a brighter sound, the best rule of thumb is to move closer to the center of the speaker. You're getting the most direct, highest, kind of a highest capture of exactly what's coming out of that speaker in the center. So if you want more kind of mids, more treble, just start moving that uh, microphone towards the center. You'll notice it makes a big difference. But maybe you're like, oh, it's already too bright as it is. Like, how do I make it less bright? Well, move it towards the edge of the cone. And you got a lot of room there. Uh, and it makes, it really does cut down drastically on the uh, kind of mids, upper mids, treble when you start moving to the side of the cone. Um, but 
What if you're like, okay, my mids and my treble sound great right now, but I just keep getting this boominess. Well, there's a couple things that could be happening. Uh, and most of the time there's this thing called the proximity effect. And for those of you out there that are more knowledgeable there, I might be speaking very basic terms there, but uh, just to capture anything for all the beginners out there, let's talk about this. So there's a thing called the proximity effect. And it's basically if the microphone is getting captured too close, you get this giant pickup of all of these low frequencies that do not sound very good. And in fact, they kind of overload the capsule a little bit and create this like, you know, kind of like when you're covering your mouth and it's just kind of muffled and gross sounding. That's what happens when you get a microphone up on the amp too close. So especially with uh, condensers, oh my God, you can get some gross sounds by putting a condenser too close that just completely destroy your tone. So be careful with how close you're putting the mic. But there's also a benefit of that. If you have a brittle tone, you want to thicken it up, experiment, push the microphone closer. You might actually get the sound you're looking for with a little bit more heft in the um, microphone. So experiment. Um, now, uh, if you want less, the opposite applies. Less bass, just pull the microphone away. And then again, you can kind of capture a lot less bass frequencies that way. So I'm going to roll the, uh, the sound again through the reamp box, and I'm just going to start moving around the 57 and uh, we'll see how it kind of changes. So um, during this process, I might record a couple samples too, just so we can compare later. But for right now, uh, check out how it sounds when I move the microphone across left and right on the speaker. So check it out. All right, so right away, if you guys noticed, I moved it to the edge of the cone on the left, and right away I could hear in my headphones here very clearly that a lot of that upper character goes away. So you can see that it kind of tames and softens those mids. If you got a harsh amp, throw it over to the side. Okay, now I'm gonna do the opposite, and I'm gonna push it towards the middle of the cone. We'll see it at its brightest form, so. All right, so you notice that? Yeah, it's just, it's crazy how much extra clarity you can get in mids and treble, especially from that. So use that to your advantage. Um, now, let's talk about that proximity effect. I won't quite get it too much on the 57, um, but I'm gonna push the SM57 uh, forward towards the speaker grill, and you'll notice that the bass kind of starts picking up. But then as you pull it away, you can notice that the, you get more of like a, a distant sound. It's literally like you can hear that there's distance and it's not so close up. You get less bass. So let's hear it. So it uh, just just kind of sounds like more roomy, as they put it, you know, more room sound. So if you kind of want a little bit more um, uh, perceived depth to your recordings, back off the mic a little bit. You'll get more of your room sound. The only problem is you have to have a good sounding room. So uh, if your room doesn't sound good, if you pull the microphone farther away, you're picking up more of it. And so it might not actually be of uh, beneficial use to you. So if you do have a treated room or you're in a studio or whatever, pulling the microphone away can give you some extra texture. So um, that's basically like a quick quick and dirty there. So um, if you box that cabinet in with just the microphone in there, what kind of effect would that have on the sound instead of open air like you're doing it? Um, if you had just the mic in there when it was boxed, uh, you'll definitely get just kind of uh, bass and low frequencies and reflection. Uh, it tends to... Um, Kind of, you'll hear the reflection of the sound from the outside of the box uh, hitting the microphone in multiple angles. So it tends to uh, be good for kind of cleanliness there. Like you'll get the clearest possible sound because there's absolutely no room sound. But the problem can sometimes be that it amplifies those lows and low mids and kind of makes it sound literally boxy. 
like that 300 to 500 hertz range there. You get that kind of boxiness there. So it depends how big your isolation box is and how loud your amp is. So you can get it to sound like super thick and clear and controlled. But a lot of times in my experience, it's only if it's a volume problem, I'll use an isolation box. Otherwise, I don't like the sound of that. And I'd rather just have some room coloration because it's easier to mix with in a post there than an isolated cab. But if you're like playing like a rock record or recording it and you got like an absolutely screaming amp that's bleeding into other microphones in the room, sometimes an isolation cab is the best route. But the sound of it um, tends to kind of uh, amplify those lows and low mids. And it literally, that's why they literally call it boxy is because it's those kind of low mid sounds. So hopefully that helps that, uh, that question there for you. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's go to the condensers now. So like I said before, the condensers are a lesser trotted territory in the world of recording electric guitars. And not that they don't sound good, but because they're just more fickle and they pick up so much more that it's hard to control them. So that's why you won't uh, oftentimes see a condenser on a stage, for instance, when you're recording an electric guitar, because it literally will just bleed. Everything else will bleed into it. It's a little harder to manage. Um, so with electric guitars, though, like I said, if you're in an environment like we have, it's absolutely great. And you can get some super crisp recordings with more detail than a dynamic mic like the 57. So without getting too deep down that rabbit hole, let's just start moving around the AKG and we'll see what we can get with it. Um, that's the AKG C414, my absolute, like one of my desert island mics uh, easily. I've used it on everything. Cajon, uh, percussion, cymbals, uh, overheads, uh, electric guitar, upright bass, you know, a trombone, a trump. I've literally done pretty much everything under the sun the past couple of years with those, and they are a desert island mic. So if you do not have one of those in your arsenal or at least some sort of large diaphragm condenser, absolutely check out that link there and uh, try to get some of those. So, so anyways, that's the C414 on the right, and it's a condenser. It's huge. Uh, it sounds big and it's crisp, so we don't need a lot of uh, distance. Um, or I'm sorry, we, uh, we do need a lot of distance from the speaker in order to maintain uh, functionality. They're so sensitive that if I put it as close as the SM57 was, it just probably wouldn't sound very great. So they're a little more finicky. You got to take your time with them, but it is rewarding and uh, you'll get a great sound. So let's talk about that, though. I got it way back now. I had to move it away from the 57 earlier, but I got it moved maybe six, seven inches away. So let's see how it sounds. And then I'll just, again, do a real time kind of um, uh, movement of it so you can see how this guy sounds. So let's switch over to, I believe it is input two now. Input two is where our AKG is gonna be. Okay. And let's, let's hear it. So. So let me just double check. Cool. Everything should be good. All right, here, let's go back. So again, yeah, this one picks up super great high-end detail. So I'm going to keep it in the center here, and then I'm going to move it around. You'll hear how it very, very quickly phases the different um, brightness as I move around. So let's try to find a good tone.
I feel like that's pretty smooth right there. It's very easy with this one. Um, well, let's actually try something different because now we got the condenser. Let's actually go to uh, the drive channel on the amplifier. We'll try to get some distortion and then we'll see what the condenser sounds like with the distortion. So I'm gonna experiment. So let's pop over to that other channel. We'll see what we get. <laughs> something like that is pretty good so you can hear that the condenser is just it's a lot brighter in those upper frequencies there so uh, if you're kind of looking for clarity want something to cut through your mix when you're recording it uh, grab one of those already sounds awesome get a lot more definition with it too so let's hear it again I'm gonna record a quick sample of it so. Cool. So we had a little quick sample recorded. Um, let's go to our next microphone, though. So now you guys got the dynamic mic with the 57, got the condenser. Uh, we're going to check that out, and then we're going to go back and listen to some of those samples later. So uh, the ones that I just recorded here. So let's go to talk about the uh, VR1. That's this uh, this guy floating over here on the left now. Got moved out of the way earlier, but this is the SC Electronics VR1. It's a ribbon mic, and so yeah, sounds awesome. It has a roll off, so. It's kind of the opposite of the condenser. It has a treble roll off. So if you have something that's too bright and you want to tame it, reach for something like this. So it's again, it's pretty versatile, but it tames treble. So again, use that if you want something that's a little softer, a little more vintagey, um, works really well. So uh, let's talk about the pickup pattern though. This is something that we have not discussed yet. Different microphones will pick up sound at different patterns. Sometimes it's uh, just a kind of a unidirectional sound where it's only going to receive sound from the front of the microphone, like the 57, only captures from the front. But the 414 over there, it has a multi-pattern capture, so you can do, you can capture from the front, the back, different types of capture from the side, so there's a lot of a, a kind of flexibility with that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. With the VR1, the uh, ribbon mic over here, uh, that one is kind of a... Um, a figure eight pattern there. So what it's gonna do is pick up from the uh, front and the back there. And that's very typical of a uh, ribbon microphone just by design. Uh, but that's why you're gonna get a totally different sound with the ribbon here, because it's actually picking up the room sound from the back and the reflections of that. So you're gonna notice that the ribbon will be a lot softer um, in certain areas, but it's also just gonna have a weird kind of a roomy kind of sound to it because you're literally hearing the room behind it, which is cool. And you can use that to a really great effect. Like for instance, maybe um, you got like a bunch of string players and you don't want to record a directional sound on all of these string players. You want to capture what they sound like in the room, kind of get the whole picture of the recording. Reach for a ribbon, put up some of those if they capture the front and the back, because if you place it in certain ways, you can get this really rich whole group cohesiveness with your sound and that's kind of the benefit of things like ribbons so for all the engineers out there yeah it's always great to have at least one ribbon in your arsenal just for things like that and they just sound awesome on literally like everything so let's check it out let's go to the SC electronics and we will hear what that sounds like on the amp so i'm just going to loosely place it and for right now let's uh, let's fire up a different track and how about this? Let's go to one of the other samples that I had. I've been using that same sample, so I think I have a another one ready to go over here. Let's let's try that out. And I won't input monitor this one this time. <laughs> all right, so all right, so let me set up a loop on that. All right. 
cool. This should be good. All right, and let's make sure we're getting some sort of signal here. Cool. All right, and let's arm another track. This is where we're going to record our ribbon microphone at. So we got input three on this. And then bear with me, guys, while we set this up. But here we go. We should be good. So I'm just going to fire this up. And we're going to uh, try to capture some audio with this and the ribbon. So how about that? You can tell this massive difference in the ribbon with just me placing it um, in various spots because we're getting such a large pickup pattern. There's so much pickup on it, you get a lot of room. So anyways, uh, I just moved it kind of dead center there and I'm about six inches, four inches back-ish. Um, and keep in mind guys, I do have a colored sound right now because I'm literally two feet away from the amplifier kind of screaming at me. So it might not be the most uh, accurate and best way to do this. Um, uh, to hear it in my headphones while being right in front of it it'll color my kind of perception there but the best of my ability i'm going to move this around and you'll hear the vast difference in the ribbon there so it, it just sounds great though so check it out So, sounds awesome. I could probably stand to move it a little bit closer too, but you notice the proximity effect we discussed earlier on that is pretty sensitive. Uh, so yeah, if you get it pretty close, you can get that like kind of uh, like a, pu a pumping effect from it as well with the ribbons. So just be careful of that. Um, otherwise, really, really love the high end on this because what we talked about, it hasn't, the microphones have a natural roll off of the treble so even when you're putting it right in front of the middle of the amp, like we talked about, where it's brightest, you still get all this great clarity from it and you can actually kind of experiment with that. So let's try something else. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be able to stereo this one like we had initially intended. I was hoping to maybe do like a stereo mic thing, but we only got a mono reamp box out here. So I'm just gonna show you guys a couple other tricks uh, that you can do to kind of wrap up our uh, presentation here. It's a couple more tricks you can do. And one of them is you can move the microphone left and right to get different sounds. You can move it forward and backward to get different bass sounds. But there's other things you can do too. And uh, it's kind of putting your microphone at 45 degree angles. I love doing that with um, 57s or with Sennheiser MD421s because you can get cool kind of effects with that. So basically, instead of putting your microphone dead straight, Put the microphone at like a 45 degree angle relative to the grill cloth and you'll notice that it can kind of tame harshness a lot of times with amplifiers at least in my experience so same thing it's like it can just kind of soften like maybe an amp that's too kind of uh, pingy or bright so you just kind of if you just slightly angle it it just softens that attack on it and could even help you with compression problems if you're having uh, transient spikes and things like that if you're trying to mix it if you do that you can cut down a little bit on that like really pingy uh, uh, sound there, which kind of plagues a lot of uh, more amateur recordings. So let's go try that out. So how about this? Let's go to, let's go to the 57 again. Why not? So we'll go back to the 57 and I'm going to angle it and we'll see if, we'll see how much perceivable difference we can get here with, uh, with this demo. We should be able to notice a difference between having it straight on and having the 57 angles. It's just subtle, but you should be able to hear it. So let's uh, check it out. So I'm going to go get, grab that 57 and See you guys in a second. So.
So I don't know about you guys, but that was pretty noticeable to me at the end there. Once we put it back straight on, it really does just kind of increase kind of the coloration, the kind of raggedness of the uh, sound when it's straight on versus when it's angled. So that's my uh, advice for you guys. If you got maybe like a, I don't know, maybe like an old fender or something like that, you're turning it up, starts to get some extra hair, but like harsh kind of upper mid treble to it, back off the mic like a slight angle and that usually is a really good sweet spot. So um, like I said though, we can't talk about stereo mic placement now because I just don't have a stereo reamper right now to show you, but um, experiment with two microphones too. Uh, miking a guitar cab with two microphones is one of my most favorite studio tricks because it's just so great. It's like, if you have a 57, a lot of times they sound great, but that upper treble content is just not there. So put a 57, not to say that's a fault because usually it's exactly the range that the guitar is in. So that's all you need. But if I'm talking like way upper treble crispiness there, uh, if I want that, throw a 57 on there and then throw maybe like a, another dynamic microphone that might be brighter and mix those two together. Um, so it's kind of like they're both um, operating in their optimum frequency range and they both pair well with each other. You can get great effects by doing a stereo um, mic pair like that. For instance, like I mentioned before, you could do a Sennheiser MD421 with an SM57. Uh, you can also do just like pr pretty much any of these three mics in conjunction would work very well, including the 414. Uh, I find those work very well if you back them off about a foot or two from a cabinet and then you do like an omnidirectional pickup pattern. You can catch the room and you can get the 57 up close. Best of both worlds. Close mic, far mic, blended into taste. So uh, stereo mic, do not sleep on that. It sounds awesome. The only thing you have to watch for is phase issues, which is something we have not talked about. And I know that's kind of a buzzword. If you're a beginner, you might be like, okay, well, what is phasing like how can i watch out for that well all phasing basically is is that you're having a microphone capture a source you're having a second microphone capture a source if they're not the same distance away from the sound source they're going to be reaching the microphone at slightly different times and when that happens it creates a kind of like a, a phasing or a chorusing effect if they're not properly aligned that makes the tone completely change so what you really got to watch out for if you're going to do the stereo effect is you really got to try your best to get the two microphones absolutely as close as possible to the sound source relative to each other. And that usually ends up fixing it. Um, and then don't worry, though, it's not too much of an exact science. Uh, you can record and then kind of slide your waveforms over in uh, your DAW um, later to align them properly if you really have to. But it's just best practice to just try to get the mics relative to each other the exact distance away from the sound source. That usually fixes your phasing. And even better if you're doing it, a stereo pair of a matched pair of microphones is even best too, because it's the exact same microphone. You'll know right away when it sounds weird with two microphones. But in my experience, I love doing different dynamic mics paired together. It's really great. So um, don't sleep on doing the stereo miking, like I said. It, you can get really great effects. You can pan both of them differently later to spread your stereo image. Oh, it's just like, it's too, too much fun. Uh, so guys, I still got the chat pulled up. Um, feel free to drop a line there if you want me to cover anything that I might have missed. Um, but just let's recap before I let you guys go here. Uh, first off, choose a mic. That's always where you got to start. Do you need a dynamic mic? Are you recording... A heavy metal guitar player who's playing like a, you know, a double 412. Okay, well, you're probably going to want to throw a dynamic on it. Do you need a condenser microphone? Okay, are you recording like, you know, maybe a clean guitar that's not going to be very loud? Grab a condenser. You'll get a lot of clarity. Um, are you going to be needing a vintage vibe? Something kind of like old school. Grab a ribbon. They're awesome. They got that old school roll off like a record sounds when records kind of roll off the high end there. It's awesome. So choose your microphone type. Second, place your microphone pop properly and uh, make sure you're getting the right levels. Again, I did not discuss that earlier, but inherently I was checking all of my levels as I went. But check your levels going into your um, interface as well. <laughs> your microphone, even if you placed it like a pro and you don't level or gain stage it, it's going to sound crappy. So just make sure that you level, level your gain staging in your microphone into your interface properly. That's crucial. After that, choose your mic placement. 
Towards the center of the cone is the brightest. Towards the outer edge is the darkest, less mids. Adjust your bass frequencies. Too boomy, pull the mic back. Not thick enough, put the microphone closer to the cone. And then experiment from there. It's all about experimentation. Know what you're looking for, get it right on the way in. I cannot stress this enough, folks. Get the sound as close as you possibly can to what you want on the way in. Don't be the guy that says, oh, we'll fix it later. You will hate yourself as you're trying to mix for hours to clean up some stuff that sounded not quite right on the way in. Get it right on the way in to your recording and you will thank yourself later. So using the tips that I just mentioned, you will be able to get a great guitar sound. And the best part is that it's forgiving. There still is adjustments you can do. You can still, it's still gonna be mixed, but if you do these um, kind of uh, tips that I'm talking about, you will get a great guitar tone. And uh, as you guys have heard, it's not as uh, difficult as it might seem. So hopefully this demystified some of the uh, kind of uh, foibles and uh, fears that you might've had about miking a guitar amplifier. Um, but I don't see anything in the chat. So, I think that'll just uh, wrap up here, folks. So let's do a recap on our mics, though. We got the Shure SM57. We got the AKG C414. And we got the SE Electronics VR1. Check out all these mics. These are mainstay of our uh, Zounds live stream operation. We use them pretty much almost every stream. So check them out. We got the links in the chat for different microphones as well. And as always, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope this presentation was helpful. Uh, tune in next time as we cover more things in the future. So thanks again, guys.